Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today it is our distinct pleasure to introduce Renata Barcelos as our guest. Renata, tell us a bit about your river of life. Thank you guys for inviting me to come here. Well, I'm, um, I'm a civil engineer, and, but I also have a master degree and a PhD on management, on business administration. And I'm from Brazil. Um, I have worked for a long time, for like since 2000. I have been working as a management consulting and I started my career working on uh, goals deployment and business uh, planning and uh, strategic planning and in process, um, process improvements too. And in 2008, after my master's degree, I came to, to teach. So I'm also a teacher and I teach inside companies. I do in companies uh, programs to help companies to, to develop themselves. Nowadays, I'm working especially with ambidexterity because I usually work with traditional companies and I have also worked a lot with family, family companies to help them to become more ambidextrous. And yeah, this is my, my challenge to, to, do, to deal with innovation and efficiency at the same time, the exploitation and exploration um, issue. And that's it. This is my, my, my life, my uh, business life. I mean, my professional life. That's wonderful. Now, uh, we usually explain also why our guest is uh, is a guest on The Focus. Uh, in our case, Renata joined us uh, a couple of years ago when we did our original adaptive oversight uh, research. We met her through um, Samuel, who was a previous guest on The Focus as well. And Renata has impressed us with her insights, with her passion for improvement in organizations. And we thought, wow, uh, we have to have you as a, as a guest on The Focus uh, as well. It's, it's going to be really interesting to hear some of your thoughts on adaptive oversight. And we call it um, adaptive because overseeing initiatives needs to be more tailored more well suited to the needs of the initiative we propose and we like the word oversight rather than governance because oversight has this dual meaning of i'm noticing the big picture i'm seeing um what's going on but i also have this meaning of oops we had an oversight we forgot something so there's always great value in having a little bit of oversight it's insufficient to just have the people involved in the work doing the work and reflecting on the work it's always beautiful to have an external perspective as well i, I love this perspective and nowadays i feel really touched by it because i i, I have been in a in a time of my career that i have feeling so many so many doubts about my professional approach i mean i have i think we have to change so many things in the way we, we approach the companies and when as i have learned in the old school strategy school and i really think that nowadays things are changing and i'm learning every day and i, I don't feel myself uh, certain or ready perfectly ready for all the challenges i always think myself that i really have to learn a lot and to change mm -hmm. some perspectives that i had before yeah, that's quite a key skill is to unlearn what we know and relearn continuously. Um, that That's quite a big theme with uh, that, that we're noticing. I want to go back to uh, something you mentioned earlier. You, you, you have spent quite a lot of time in academia before you transitioned into the more uh, in, into the, 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 the world of business. Um, and uh, I don't know how long back you've you've concluded all of those studies and research for you for your PhD and so on, but I'm curious as to what did you find in your studies and your research uh, that covers this type of topic, this adaptive oversight. Yeah, well, um, in fact, I have 
done my acad academic work in the middle of the, the business work. I have, okay. I have worked in business, then I stopped, I did my, <clears throat> my, my master degree, then I came back to the business world, and then I stopped and went to my PhD, <laughs> and then I came back to the business world, and so I'm always changing. But uh, I had, I had, I think, two, two discoveries. I mean, if, I, if I'm going to speak about academia, in my master's degree, I worked with um, family businesses. And it was really remarkable to see how, well, all the, the, the doubts and the questions that family business have, and also the way that uh, to be innovative, to be ready to compete, they have to develop the governance issue. I mean, the corporate governance issue must be settled down. So they come to another level of, uh, of competition of uh, results. And, and this, is, this is really useful for me because nowadays I really deal with family business. And we have lots of them here in Brazil, all around the world. And then in the, the master degree, the, in the PhD, I worked on uh, dynamic capabilities. Mm -hmm. And it was a paper that I, I read and I, th I thought, oh, this is a good paper. I'd like to work on this. And it gave me, me a lot of insights about innovation. And that's when ambidexterity came to my mind. I, I have never had such it was 2014 mm -hmm. and i was not really worried about the dexterity and i questioned the the paper that i read and i, th I said come on it's not all about uh, dynamic capability capabilities companies have to have to deal with dynamic capabilities and also ordinary capabilities mm -hmm. because this is where the money comes from i mean uh, the, the, the milky cow, you, know, you, you, you take the money from the products you know, you, mm. you already have, you control, um, you, have, you are efficient on this, and then you have to deal with the, the, the dynamic capabilities too. So I did a research on 80, 85 medium and big companies in Brazil. And what I found out was that usually they are better on ordinary capabilities all of mm. them, but the, the greater they are, the better they are in um, dynamic capabilities, which is the capabilities for innovation. It's quite obvious, and I'm not sure if, if um, the performance is, the performance is, is uh, I mean, the capabilities cause the performance. Mm. I mean, if you have innovation capabilities, mm. you have great performance. But I'm also in doubt if it's the opposite way. I mean, maybe the performance, the good performance may cause the innovation. I mean, the companies are good, they are okay. So they have time and they have uh, the courage, they have the structure to innovate. So I'm always on this doubt. I have not decided this cause and effect relation, but mm. I think you must think about it. You cannot say, to be to have a good um, a good performance, you have to be innovator because maybe it's the opposite way. I mean, in the in, in reality, in the behavior of the companies. So this is the the main results of my 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 studies, and it's not a, a big discovery, but I mean, it helped me to organize how I think about innovation and how complex and difficult it is to, to, to uh, uh, maybe a, a medium company, which mm. is not in a good performance level to think about innovation. It's really difficult for them. They don't have money, they don't have people, they don't have uh, the time to, to think about innovation. They are struggling to, to survive and to, to build, to be stable in the business they are. So how they're going to think about innovation. And so I, I have a very um, realistic or pragmatic approach on innovation. I think there are some times that you talk about innovation, but I know that the company cannot hear about it. It's not their time. They have to do another yeah. work. They have to do some money first, and then they think about innovation. But I'm, I'm always trying to bring to them a way that they can help or they can try to uh, 
find a way to innovate on collaboration with other companies and to think about future in the different perspective. But it's not easy at all. I'm really learning every day and I'm very careful to approach this, these companies because I'm, I'm scared of the, the ready answer. I mean, I, f yes. I feel that yes. there are some, yeah, there are some consultants and some people in the business world that think that there is a, a recipe for all the companies. And for me, I mean, I deal with lots of companies at the same time. I, I deal, I have a lot of clients at the same time. So they are all so different. Every, every one of them needs a different approach. And really, it's really hard mm. for me. It's like stressful, but it's not, uh, there, there's no way I can have an, uh, just one approach to all of them. Yeah, that's uh, what we've learned quite a lot. And, and we keep seeing that message being reinforced from uh, frameworks such as Discipline, Agile, and so on. It says that context really counts, context matters. Uh, I wanted to just take a sidestep here on the flow of the uh, conversation and do you and, and ask you just for our viewers, do you have a definitive definition of the ambidextery dexterity that you're talking about? Yes, I mean I work on the on the 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 combination of efficiency and innovation. And I I have uh, I have written uh, an article about this to try to explain this. And I have um um, a, a model to to improve the way you think ab about ambidexterity, I think. So I do it like efficiency and innovation, like a continuum, and mm -hmm. not something which is opposite to the other. Because I think there are, you cannot define when stop the efficiency and when it start the the innovation. I think yes. there's so many things happening around, and. When when I talk about efficiency, I talk about I talk about exploitation. I mean, how you deal with you with what you already have, how you take advantage of the the assets that you are already have. And when I deal with innovation, I deal with the creation, the the new assets that you are building for future. And it's also about risk, about doubts, and companies on the dexterity, they have to think about this at the same time, how they deal with it at the same time, because there is a concurrency of resources. Mm. When you think, when, when I'm going to deliver the resource to do exploitation, when I'm going to deliver the resource to do exploration. So it's, it's a competitive uh, force inside the companies. And I also uh, increment the way you think about dexterity when you join to the conversation the concepts on resiliency and agility. Mm. Uh, I mean, not the agile concept, I mm. mean, the, the agility in the, the, the ordinary thinking that we have about it, because you have to be fast enough um, as, your, as your industry. So you have to answer to the demands of the industry, or even you have to change the industry by yourself. So you can be the first mover. So you have to be agile to do that. And you always have to be, to have the resiliency to know, to be sure that something is going to be wrong. I mean, there, you're going to have some, some problems in your, in your, in your journey. And uh, you have to know how to deal with this risk, to know what kind of risk you can take, and not to put all the all your assets in in a position that they can blow away. I mean, mm. You have to be thinking about all of this all the time. And I use the examples of companies like Kodak and 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 Blockbusters. I mean, the great companies that had all the money in the world to hide the best consultant firms that they wanted and they managed to put it away and to, to disappear. And this is the, the argument that I use to, to, to show people that they have to answer. They have to, they, they cannot, uh, they cannot run away from being ambidextrous. There's no mm. way in this, this world of 
of nowadays, this VUCA world, this volatile and uncertain world, how they're going to answer. They have to answer with ambidexterity. So this is the, the concept that I use. Thank you for that explanation and, and it makes a lot of sense. I want to go back to you using the word innovation and efficiency. Um, what we what, what I'm curious about is to ask you about what about effectiveness, because efficiency for the sake of efficiency may not achieve really valuable outcomes. So what about effectiveness in this amber dexterity? dexterity that you talked about yeah actually maybe because we don't have this difference so strong work in here in brazil of efficiency and and effectively and but maybe what when i talk about efficiency i'm talking about effectively and i, I really have to think more about it because when i think when i talk about efficiency i talk about the way you control your process you know your process you are the owner the master of the process that you know you already dominate them and they are they, they are the process that allow you to build um, richness to build money and so this is what i understand about efficiency but maybe the word eff effectively is is more is more adequate for this i have never thought about it it's a good a good provocation yeah well um, it's quite obvious right there's not much sense in thinking about efficiency unless you're effective because if you're yeah. not effective then what are you doing you're not delivering value to your customer getting really efficient at not delivering is kind of yeah. besides the point yeah 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 and this also brings to mind something that you mentioned earlier this notion of being ready perfectly we have this feeling of i want to be perfectly prepared and there's always and a feeling of i'm not quite ready i'm not quite ready i'm not quite ready i'm not quite ready and hey the world still keeps going you have to decide you're ready and people talk about uh, imposter syndrome it's like oh i don't have the skill i don't have the know-how but you have to get going yeah you have yeah. to you have to keep at it you gave the example of um kodak or blockbuster we're not ready to change. We're making so much money. We're not ready to change. We're making so much. Oh my God, all our money is gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's a really interesting challenge. How do we notice uh, what warning signs do we pay attention to, to say, hey, get on with it now. Start working on this innovation. Go from, um, I'm harvesting great value to, I need to create new and different and better value. What are your thoughts? Wow, this is a difficult question <laughs> because, and I'm not sure about it, as I'm not sure about most of the, th the things that I, I say on, on business, but I'm not really uh, counting on the signals anymore. I mean, I'm not searching for signals anymore. I'm working with the premise that things are going to change so hard in the long term that your industry may change too so i mean you you gotta stay and this is my perspective right now i may change it next month but and you must be so certain that you are not sure about what you're going to have 10 years ahead and you must be sure that uh, to build capabilities it's not an easy task. You cannot build a capability, a corporation capability in all of a sudden, you have to have time to build some capabilities. Even the collaboration capability and the culture capabilities, they are not built all of a sudden. So if you take time to build the capability and you know things are going to change in five or 10 years, you gotta start doing something right now. I'm not, I do not know what you're going to start, and this is a question that I have in my mind when I work on strategic planning, how to think in the long term mm. versus doing testing experiment in the short term. This is not an easy test. This is not an equation that is 
really settled out for me for me I, I, I try to I try to find a way every time as I teach I try to find a way to explain it in a better way and I was I use a, a book from from Mark Johnson which is lead from the future to to try to tell people you are not sure about the changes you're not sure about the tendencies that are going to to hit your your industry but something is going on and you've got to think on five or ten years and if you're going to if, if you if you are working now the same way you were working five years ago or ten years ago there's something strange in your company good that you have survived it but what if you say the same thing uh, five years ahead I mean, you are working in, two, in 2027 in the same way you work in 2022. So, I mean, there's so many technology being developed nowadays. Does it make any sense? Could it make any sense? So I don't, I'm not searching anymore for these signs, for the, even the small signs or the big signs. I'm, I'm working on the way, come on, things are changing so hard. You're, you do not know where we are going to, but you got to act. You got to try mm. to, to build another way. So you, you create options. I, I always use the, these words, options, because in, in the future, you may have the option. You take the option or you do not take it, but you got to build it. Mm. You got to have the chance. That's, uh, this is my perspective. So that, that's a great uh, departing assumption when you want to look into the future is assume that things are going to be different. So uh, that, that, that's really cool. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier about the uh, master's degree research that you've done when you looked at family businesses. And this is something we haven't really explored or touched on in detail yet in our interviews. So I'm curious as to oversight in family businesses. In many cases, those family businesses are chairman of the board, they're this ex the chief executive officer or managing director, and sometimes also the, the chief operating officer, if, if you want to call it that. Um, and in there, there's a clear conflict of interest when it comes to oversight. Um, how have you seen family businesses deal with that conflict? Um, these are, uh, are classic conflicts. And my perspective is that uh, because I work on the business perspective, I always work mm. with <clears throat> some other perspectives, some other people to help me when I'm inside a, a family business, which is a psychology and um, an advocate, uh, a, mm. a law person. So it's the, the three of it, because we deal with the questions of the family, of the business and of the, the pr property, the legal issues and, and all. And for me, for myself, I try, I bring uh, rationality. I try to bring more rationality to the family businesses. And I, I try to work on the questions of financial cash questions and strategic questions and innovation questions. And I try to show them how the, the family questions, how the, the problems that they have among the, the family persons, the family players, how that can compromise the rationality, the economic rationality. Mm -hmm. When I do that and, they, and, and I just, I, I bring a lie to them, oh, come on, you are doing this irrationally and you are impacting your company. Then I call a psychology, and then I call uh, a, a law person, an advocate that comes to, to deal with the more uh, law and psychological issues. But it's important to have someone with the business perspective because you are, every time you're trying to, to show them, for example, there is some, there's an issue that not even in the, the, the companies that are not familiar, uh, they, they they solve so well, which is succession, because succession is mm. a problem that every company has, have. And then the, the, even the, the more rational companies don't, don't solve this question. And then I go to the, to the, the, family, uh, the family company. It's, sometimes it's even easier to, to deal with because they know, come on, does my, 
my son is going to bring this uh, this this business on does my that my my daughter fits it they are going to build the future of this company and they they this is a question that should be asked for every company not even not only the family but on family business this is there are some 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 problems that brings pain for them it's not mm. easy because you cannot change people when they have their interests they have their their perspective you cannot force uh, a son or a daughter to to love the company to love this kind of work i mean you can you can build so many unhappiness mm. because of these assumptions and this is what i also try even i'm not a psychology i i try to to talk to them to 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 tell them, to convince them to work with a psychology, specialize it on the, the issue, to so then can they can bring this kind of pain and they can solve this kind of pain. Mm. But it is a very long-term work. And myself, I try to be on the, the rationality side, but it's it, there is the subjective side which must be taken care of. This is why I work with this, always treat people the, on the same project. That's a really great workaround in order to deal with the, these issues. And in many cases, these families are so in, in, entrenched in infighting. But it's a good, from an oversight perspective, it's really good to ask those questions around succession and how do we actually work together? They talk about begin with the end in mind. So what is the end that we have in mind? So really good, uh, good ideas there. Thank you, Renata. Yeah, and if I may uh, compliment, um, there are some great performance delivered by family companies. Mm -hmm. And there are some studies that show that they can, uh, they can live hard times for longer periods than the non-family companies because they have love for what they have mm. so they can the, the family can sacrifice themselves the owner can sacrifice themselves for a harder time for longer time and then the other company the other company that is not familiar so i really love family business i think they should be very cared very respected and i don't work with the perspective that Either you are a family business, either you are a professional business. I mean, you can be a family business and you can be a professional business at mm. the same time. It all depends on the types of competences that you have. And it also depends on how, how open people communicate and how safe it is to communicate. Oh. Yeah. Yes, communication yeah. is a key issue for me. Very good. One thing that... Um sprang to mind for me you were talking earlier about oh i'm not sure oh i'm not sure and i'm fascinated how in the past we have been so gripped culturally by this notion that oh you must project an aura of certainty i know what i'm doing yeah. i'm the leader i have the answers you will do what i say because i'm the clever one I'm the thinker that have, has thought through uh, things. You can trust in me. I'll look well after you and so on. And the short answer is all of that is smoke and mirrors. Yes. Because there yes. is no certainty. Yeah. Poof, COVID yeah. happens. How many magnificent strategic plans have been disrupted by, oh, small pandemic? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it happened here too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it has changed the way people lead. But I think that how, the, the, how we speak about it is very, is very important because people have to feel themselves free to have doubts. And people have to feel themselves okay to, to see that their leaders have doubt. And, and I always say to my clients, don't trust anyone who comes here with certainty. Don't, don't trust anyone who comes here trying to tell you what you're going to do. Because reality is built, it's socially built. 
So uh, you got to be very careful on the complexity times that we live. You got to be very careful in your proposition. And I really trust on this social building strategy and social be building reality. This is why I think that every company has its own reality because it's about what people believe, what people can do, what people aim to do. And this is why I think there's no recipe for anything. You just have ideas, you have business models, approach to think about, to organize the way you think, but not ever a, a recipe. And I'm really scared of people that are full, full of certainty or anything. And notice how equally so we could say, Renata, all of that is heresy. Right, Because I'm the big boss, I'm paid to make the right decisions, I'm paid to be certain to bring in the numbers quarter after quarter, right? So me believing that there's no certainty, you must be crazy. And I'll show you that you're wrong because, hey, I will make the numbers. But mm -hmm. what happens then is I push my people and they start cutting corners and ethics start to fray. And we make the numbers, but we damage people. So then our environmental impact, our social impact, our ethics and governance and oversight practices start to kind of get a little bit frayed. What's your thinking yeah. in this space? A little bit. Try a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that people are more willing to, to build things, to get things together. Mm. And every time that someone try, I had a, a client next, next uh, month, uh, last month, and she, she tried to be the, to be bossy and to show everyone that she has the, the certainty of everything. And it was such a huge mistake that, that she did. And everyone realized that and realized, it, oh, so, and, and before she, she had this explosion of certainty and, and bossy explosion, I had sent them an article that I wrote, which is about changing your mindset, changing your culture from um, command and control culture, change it to competence and confidence culture. And everyone had enjoyed the, the article and was thinking about this. And all of a sudden, the owner of the company said, I know what you're going to do. And you're going to do this. You, you do not know what you, you're doing. And it was so shocking, so shocking to everyone. And some people uh, went away, said, I'm not working with her. And then she said she had to step back and to, to say, I'm sorry. I did a mistake and I oriented her. I said, you must not do that. You cannot do that. You are putting everyone on the wrong side. I mean, do you want people to wait for you to command or do you want people to think by themselves and to propose you mm. how you're going to improve? Do you want people to think and to know what are the, the, the people who know the client, people who are in front of the client, what are, are they going to decide? They're going to wait for you to say what they're going to do. And then she realized it and she, she, she was sorry. She, she asked, uh, she, she told everyone she was sorry about it and she changed her, her way. And then, and I told, to her, I told her now, you're going to start building the, the trust that you want to have. Because in that way, the other way, you could not have the trust you, you, will, you, will, you are willing to have. And on the, the, the ethical side, I think this is something that is so important that everyone talks about it right now. I mean, if you study a little bit about business, you are worried about it. And people are not accepting the, the wrong side of the force anymore. I mean, <laughs> they, they know what's right, what's wrong, and your, your employees are not accepting it anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's not even in the big companies, the high skilled professionals. I mean, this is everywhere. People mm -hmm. study and talk about it everywhere. I mean, you got to work with this perspective. People think, people uh, want to be respected, and there's no other way you're going to lead. 
Yeah, we talk about becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. So you 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 mentioned competence, about, uh, competence and confidence, and that's part of the journey. Is we have to learn to build that confidence. We have to navigate the uncomfortableness, and that's his capability: is the skill to navigate uncomfortableness. And doubt is a part of that process of building confidence. You cannot have confidence unless you have gone through doubt. So, yeah. that's... because confidence is based on the way you become vulnerable too. I mean, yes. <laughs> you have the confidence in this built on vulnerability, and you got to show yourself vulnerable to be sure that you have this confidence. And this is totally, totally agree with you. And, and there is there is a, a nice story about this competence and confidence uh, concept that I use because it's a really my clients really like this approach and but i have one client that was really so in love with this this idea and i once i told them you cannot work on this command and control culture that you have inside your company and they were really stressed by it they were they were they were going away i mean they were so pressured by it that they change it all of a sudden they went to the competence and confidence side mm -hmm. the only problem was that the competences that they were working were only soft skill competences with only the leadership competences and they worked much more in the confidence side than the competence side in the full range of it so they started to be uh, more Complacive. Complacent? Does the word this work? Complacent. Complacent, maybe. Complacent. 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 Yes. Yeah. Complacent. With some uh, lack of competence or basic competence. For example, it was a company based on project and projects. And people did not know how to do, how to manage a project. <laughs> and they said that's okay because we conf we, we trust everyone we are we are we love each other we care about each other we take care of everyone and then and i came back to them and i i, I saw it and they said come on you are a project company how is that possible that you do not know how to manage a project and mm. so, they said but it's okay we have a good climb everything is okay <laughs> You didn't get the idea right to be confident. You, you got to have the competence and the hard skills too. Mm. Otherwise, you cannot trust people. You cannot trust the work that they do. So it's always, uh, uh, it's funny. It's a funny story, but it's true. And I, I, it's a way that I use to remind people that you got to know what, you got to be good on what you do. You got to have the, the, the hard skill and the soft skills together so you mm. can trust yourself, you can trust in your team, and you can grow as a team, as a, an autonomous team that build, that propose, that can create. One thing I see as a golden thread through all the Stoic uh, readings that I do is this little phrase of competence builds confidence. Oh, they have this 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 phrase. I I didn't know. Yeah, it. <laughs> it's 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 an idea about the more competent you are with something, the more confidence you have about doing that something. That's so. exactly the idea that I have. Yeah, I, I yeah. just didn't know it was from the Stoics. It was, it and was yet, good to know. <laughs> we have a paradox, because notice the more competent we become at understanding the need for changing businesses the more we notice oh we're not confident in the precise way of changing businesses yeah <laughs> so we are more <clears throat> competent and yet <laughs> there's a counterbalancing that that makes us less confident if you will Mm. Yeah, but this is but maybe the competence is just be in doubt because if things are changing so so fast, you will not be ready or you will never know for certain what to do. But you know that you can search for it, that you can improve, that you can study, that you can learn, and this is the first step. So this is a very nice, uh, a nice. Um, pressure to go on to to go to the right side to to keep going 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where that continuous learning comes in because every new piece of information will build on our confidence, uh, uh, on our competence, sorry. <laughs> uh, every new learning builds co competence, but then as the world changes, um, it would erode that as well. So it's a, it's a cycle. The key ingredient yeah, here is hope. Because mm -hmm. hope is the engine that makes it possible to take the leap and say, maybe I'm not perfectly ready, but I hope that I'm ready enough, that mm -hmm. I'm actually going to go out there and I'm not going to be smashed and crushed and destroyed. I hope that there's yeah. a possibility of thriving, of coming through the other end better and stronger. So hope is such a critical engine of achievement of, of getting better of getting stronger of going through the obstacle and using the obstacle as an engine to get better yeah definitely hope i mean it's a such a it's such an important feeling and it gives you the energy to go on i mean it's on the pandora box it was the last to go away so i mean it's it's such a powerful thing that really touched me when I think, how am I going to build the energy of the team? How can this leader, because I think this go to the leadership issue, how can this leader brings more, bring more uh, hope, more energy, more uh, motivation for people to go ahead? Because I don't think this is obvious. I don't think it's easy. Mm -hmm. And first, the leader, had, this is how, how I see leaders and I admire them so much when they have all the, the energy and the power to, to show people, to, to, to give hope to people. And I really think that hope is very, very powerful. I'm not sure about, of course, I would not be sure, of course. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm really always trying to find a way that leaders can bring this hope and this energy to people to work together. And I don't have a recipe. I just talk <clears throat> about it. I study about it, but not yet uh, a framework or something very, very powerful to, to tell you. But I'm, I, I'm, I'm willing for, I, I talk about this with Horia sometimes. And I'm, I'm always, I always learn with him so many things about this. So on that question of hope, um, maybe that's something to consider as an oversight practitioner or somebody in a position of overseeing or oversight. One of the things to monitor is hope and how much hope exists or how much false hope is created. Um, because false hope is just as destructive as, uh, as, as any other behaviors in an organization. So where have you seen in your, in your career how an oversight capability or a person in an oversight situation carefully cultivated that hope and not let it become false hope, uh, but actually turned into inspiration? It's a difficult question. I mean, I think, there, I, I think it's really difficult to differentiate the false hope from hope. I mean, when you feel it, it's always hope. You're, mm. you're not sure that it's false world, false hope. And you can always be wrong about your beliefs. And because you can always be wrong about the future. Mm. And I think that but there is the manipulation too. There is the hope and always the manipulation that people just do it. Some leaders can, some bosses can do it just to, to lead people to the way they want. But I think that if it's real, really uh, connected to people, connected to what you want the growth of other people and not just connect it with yourself. Uh, for example, I have some clients that I feel when I talk to them, I really feel that they want their people to grow. And they try to, they, they, they are not certain of anything, but 
they try to build, they give the chances, the, the, the opportunities uh, of these people to work by themselves and to propose things and bring ideas and bring some new knowledge and to search for new knowledge. I, this is not the majority of the companies, of course, but I really feel that there are some, and I'm, I'm especially thinking about a family business here, actually two family business that I have as clients. They are, they are amazing. I mean, they care so much about their people, how they want their people to grow with them. Mm. And, it's really interesting when you compare to others. But for example, this example that I gave from this leader that uh, broke up with everything and, and fight with the, the, the guys that work with her, she was, she was thinking about herself, just about herself. And my company, my beliefs, my success, my money. For, she uses she uses a, a phrase a terrible mm. phrase like I cannot take I cannot put more, more money on this company if you continue like this so this is I mean for her she was trying to give energy to the people but it could never work mm. and so I, I'm not sure if I have answered your question because I really I think it's really difficult to differentiate the false hope from the hope maybe I, I try to differentiate it from the manipulation and the real, real hope. Mm. This is what I, I thought. That's a really interesting uh, perspective. Uh, let's look at the key word here is false hope. False means we have a perspective, we have an idea, we have a representation that <clears throat> does not match what is actually going on. Mm. And the falseness is something that always happens because when I imagine something that doesn't exist yet, to begin with, it's false. It doesn't exist. Mm. And yet, through some magic of this world, I transform it from the false early concept of something that doesn't exist into the reality of, oh, now it's true. And the key that makes it from false to true is an intention, a determination, a discipline that makes it so, right? I'm weak, I'm incapable, and I say to myself, I will get strong, and I will be able, I will become capable. And I believe that every obstacle helps me to get better and stronger and more effective in that way. And I go from false weakling into, wow, I am capable and competent, right? And human history is littered with examples of remarkable excellence achieved through overcoming Tremendous obstacles and odds, right? So uh, I'm a practitioner of Aikido, and O Sensei, um, where Shiva Morihei, uh, O Sensei, uh, he was a very sickly child, tiny and very weak. And his um, uncle, uh, Takeda Sensei, was extremely powerful and strong and harsh. So um, somehow, O sensei got inspired to overcome and practice and practice and practice and practice. And despite his initial frailty, he became the superlative martial artist of his generation, basically. He was unchallenged. <laughs> That's why he became yeah. the uh, instructor to the royal uh, guards, uh, well, the, the emperor's guards and, uh, and, and so on, right? So um, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating how something that can appear at first glance, oh, look at this person. They're so tiny, they're so weak. They can't possibly be uh, any good, right? You look at, for instance, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, one of the early geniuses of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was exactly in the same situation. He was so weak, so frail. He could hardly do push-ups or pull-ups or anything like that. And yet because of that, and because of that passion and determination to, I'm gonna watch, I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna practice, I'm gonna get strong. 
he actually figured out so much more effective techniques, so much more effective ways of using even this frailty, even this weakness to overcome against, oh, wow, amazing odds, right? And that's what's transformed Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu into such a foundational um, practice that is kind of underpinning most everything in modern mixed martial uh, arts um, challenges and, yeah. and so on. You must understand and practice Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to be anywhere effective. Yeah, and, and bringing it to, to groups, no? to, to, to companies. I really believe on sense making. I mean, if the group buys the idea, if the mm. group works together around it, if it makes sense for them, they can build some amazing things. Yeah. And it's funny how maybe sometimes the group is not the, the highest skilled person on the company, but they work so well together that they, they, they can build some very nice things. I remember that I work with OKRs. I really, I'm a big fan of OKRs. And because I work with uh, management systems for dexterity. And once we had a, an OKR and the team was built from very operational per people on this company. And people that work on the health of health um, job, the, the health of the, the work. I do not know how to say this in health, English. Health and safety. Um, health and safety, yes, yeah, exactly. And they were very operational. They had never appeared, uh, showed themselves to, to the whole company. And they did such a nice job on this OKR. They delivered so much. They became famous on the company. Oh, they are the guys that did that because it makes sense for them. It was a very nice group mm. working together. I cannot explain the chemistry of that group. I could say that the leadership was really a very important uh, issue on that specific <clears throat> group, but it was amazing how they did something fast and uh, something that they were trying to do a long time ago. And in three months, they installed what they want, which mm -hmm. was a program of health and security. And they were so happy and everyone was so happy with them. So this group, the sense-making in the group for me is really a very important issue. Yeah, that sense-making can only happen if the right type of safety exists. You, the, the four types of safety, that uh, psychological safety, it's not only a leader's responsibility to ensure that that safety exists, but from an oversight perspective, there's some key things that to notice and to ask around, do we have challenger safety or do we have learner safety or do we have participation safety? Um, in, in that group so overseeing something like that those are really good questions to ask yeah yeah it's it, it's um, it, it's good because i didn't know about these four kind of 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 safety and it, i'm going to use it <laughs> from well, now and <laughs> it's tim clark's work you forget we've covered it a few times but that's okay no, <laughs> no really yeah. i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> no worries no worries it's easy uh, to forget i'm going to I'm going we've, to study it harder. Yeah, we, we've, we've <laughs> and, covered so much. Yeah. Yeah, because we, we can help the, the teams to work on that really nice approach. Yeah. Mm. So to, uh, to re recap for our audience as well, uh, the idea is how do we create psychological safety in our organization? How do we nurture it? What do we need to pay attention to in order to establish? Because you can't just show up in the office and say, okay, guys, everybody's safe, right? Well, no, not necessarily. You have to do something. You can't just say, magic happens, uh, incantation for safety, boom. Yeah, we've said a prayer or a ritual of some sort, and now we're safe. No, it doesn't work that way. So what you do is first, you demonstrate inclusion safety. In other words, when we have a conversation to have, I'm not kind of keeping you away from the conversation. I'm actually inviting you in to the conversation. And you were talking earlier about sense-making together and strategy building together, as opposed to we do strategy at you. Yeah, we're the bosses, we're the thinkers. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, you're the yeah. idiot doers, just do what you're told. <laughs> yeah. So inclusion safety 
is hard because it requires respect from us as leaders or the people in our care. It requires the humility to think and to believe and to say, I believe you have value. I believe you have insight. I believe you have energy to contribute. Yeah? So inclusion safety and practicing it is demanding of everyone. And yet it must be done. We must show inclusion safety. Now, once we do inclusion safety, the next bit that we have to do is also not easy because the next bit is learner safety. And this is where that competence comes in that you were talking about earlier. Because for learner safety, I need to make it so that people are comfortable to put their hand up and say, uh, guys, I don't understand. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. Right. I don't get it. Help me yeah. out here. What's going on? Uh, what is this? I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get, uh, I'm scared. I'm confused. I'm incapable yet. And yet you're paying me to be capable and I'm not, and I'm afraid. So that is so hard to create learner safety. Because more often than not, you say, oh, you're incompetent. I will fire yeah. you. Yeah. Off How come? Head. How is that possible that you don't know, do not know exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Contrast that with what's happening in the more effective organizations that pra practice lean thinking and lean discipline in which you have the andon cord in which you say, I pull a, a cord and light come up and says, idiot here. Yeah. Come and help. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. earlier, Taichi Ono had the idea of bakayoke, the idiot proofing. <laughs> it was a bit harsh. <laughs> Later was changed to um, uh, pokayoke, uh, which is just uh, mistake proofing, uh, a, a, a little bit gentler. But the basic notion is we must confront. Hey, um, this doesn't quite work. Here's how we learn. Here's how we build that competence. And that's why we need that learner safety. Now, Inclusion safety, it's tricky, it must be done. Humility must be shown, respect must be paid for people. Learner safety, we must make it safe for people to ask questions and show vulnerability. And that is so hard, particularly in uh, cultures in which competence is overpriced to say the meritocracies and so on. Yeah, It's like, I can't show any weakness and therefore what am I gonna do? I'm gonna pretend. And then we go into that falsity. Yeah. I pretend that I have the competence. I'm yeah. more concerned with how I appear than what actually is. And therefore, what happens? Yeah. Well, hey, you're going to be found out. You don't get away with anything. Yeah. So what that builds to is collaborator safety. In other words, I'm no longer pretending. I'm actually inviting you into the conversation. And I listen cl closely to what you have to say. And you listen closely to what I have to say. And we engage in dialogue. And we learn together, and that kind of builds that sense making together, if you will. And even then, that's not enough because that still has the ability to say, Well, but I'm the boss. So if I don't like okay. what you have to say, I'm still going to go, Nah, nah, you're just going to do as I say. I've indulged you, I've gone through the motions, I've built all of this safety. Now just do what I say, <laughs> which kind of defeats the whole purpose, right? So the last yeah. bit in psychological safety, and this is where, see, um, David Marquet was just saying the other day, uh, leadership is a journey towards irrelevance. Oh. Yeah? <laughs> and why leadership is a journey towards relevance is because you want to challenge your ideas. You want to invite people to say, how do we break this idea? How do we make it better? It's not that it's my idea. Right, We need to challenge each other's ideas in such a way that we discover the better ideas, right? We have ideas so that the ideas can die and not us. So we get the ideas to fight and we get the best ideas to win. And therefore, who gets the idea? Whose idea is it? Well, that's not relevant. And that's why I say yeah. leadership is a path towards irrelevance. It's not whose idea is it? Oh, the great leader. Let's admire the great leader. No, that's a cult of personality. That's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But when you give the example of humility to be humble, I mean, 
this is never irrelevant to be this kind of example. I mean, I just love people that can be the example of be, being humble, being mm. humility. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the point. So this challenger safety, to invite people to challenge your ideas. Adam Grant talks about it um, in, in uh, as a great book called Think Again. He says, cultivate a challenge network. Mm. Make it a habit that when you have an idea, you don't think, oh, Oh, good me, good me, good boy, great idea. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Bring this idea to a number of people you trust and smash that idea, right? So uh, Renata and uh, Carlos and Paola, we've, we've been sort of smashing ideas together for a year and a half, almost two years now. Um, and that's been so helpful for, for, for all of us in sharpening our, our way of seeing in the world and, and sense making with our customers. Yeah, when I, I deal with some leaders and they, they start telling, my, telling to me uh, how good they are as leaders and I just talk to them, let me see your, your team working together mm. because the way they work, they are dynamic is what is going to tell me how good you are. It doesn't matter what you think or what you, how good you think you are, how you express this in words because what matters is the behavior of the team how they build, how they work together, how they collaborate, how they trust each other. And so the, the, you do not, you cannot evaluate the leader from itself, from himself, from herself. You evaluate the leader from the team and the behavior of the team. Very, very nice, uh, very nice concept this of the, the, the safeties, yes. Very good. So. I want to move on to one of our last questions here and wanted to, to check with you. In, in the original research and the, the, the group participation that we did when we discussed uh, adaptive oversight in 2020, um, you participated quite actively in that and you contributed quite a lot to that, Renata. Now, it's almost it's more than two years on from um, us uh, that from we doing that work. Um, what have you learned or noticed uh, since those times uh, about adaptive oversight? How has it changed or what additional things have you noticed from the original research? Well, I was quite um change it by the perspective that you showed to me and I I was not so connected to the leadership team the, the leadership issue the leadership subject so I, I became more closer to to this subject and I'm more willing and I give more value today to people than processes and mm. to people than than to anything. I mean, I'm an engineer, so I'm, I have worked myself on building structures and building processes to 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 help people to to do better. And um, I, I have been changing myself. And you on the oversight, adaptive oversight, help it helps me a lot. And the, you you bring to me this uh, this. The, the, the most important thing is really on people is not on the because everything comes comes from people and if you cannot understand the way they work the way they feel the way you can take the best of them and if you cannot understand them that you are not going to go anywhere i mean you cannot build the higher level team that you want to build and especially the, the, another issue is the uncertainty. I have accepted more the uncertainty issue because before I met you, I had this very uncomfortable way to think, which is, I, I really learned that when I was uh, deploying goals in big companies, that process of MBO management by objectives that I, I learned from. And, there was this big question that you can never change a goal. You can never change the goal because they are uh, static. If you change the goal, if you are not getting any goal. And 
nowadays I accept much more than certainty and I accept much more that maybe there are some goals that just have become irrelevant in the not in the new context of the world in the new context of your industry so you have to change something because the context has changed so you helped me to accept that more easily because my old school was so strict on the goals and you cannot change it you, you gotta go in front of it you keep going <laughs> but sometimes it just it doesn't make sense and I, I had some fights in, in, my, in my companies that I work because people kept saying that you cannot change the goal, you cannot change the goal. And myself, I, I was questioning it, questioning it already. I mean, I had a PhD on a, on, a, on a work that I studied dynamic contexts. And I could not accept that anymore. And, and you helped me to, to be, I, I do not feel myself lonely anymore. I mean, if I have any doubts, I think about you and I say, oh, come on, that's it. We can show our doubts. We can show our uncertainty. We, we can show our, our vulnerabilities and maybe we can change the goals. That's why I like so much working with OKRs because they are more flexible. And I, I, you really helped me a lot on, on this discussion. Right. Well, I have two ideas that come to mind for this. So one is uh, David Marquet wrote a book called Leadership is Language about exactly this topic of I am the captain of the El Faro. I'm sailing my ship. Um, we don't change the goal. We don't change the goal. We go through. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, we, we, we go um, through the, oh, it happens to be the hurricane side. Who cares? We just keep going. The goal is this. We're not changing. And by not changing, you sail straight into the heart of the hurricane and sink. And people die. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, whoops. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> not, not so good. Right? Um, now, the other insight is uh, John Boyd and his OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, and act. You don't change the goal willy-nilly. You change the goal because you're observing. And you're yeah. orienting yourself to what is actually happening. And then you're deciding and you adjust the goal. You act right away because the faster you act, the more you get the upper hand and you get to survive. You get to come home. Otherwise, being in business is not a divine right. Yeah. You don't get it just because oh, you look pretty. No, no, no. You need to be effective in the world of business. Otherwise, very much like we were saying earlier with Kodak and uh, Blockbuster and others, you can become irrelevant like that. Yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah. So therefore, changing goals is a necessity, not <laughs> a forbiddance. Yeah? Yeah. It's not that you're forbidden to change goals. You must change goals. The question is, with what frequency? How fast should we be changing goals? Because equally, then you could say, you can take it to the extreme and say, well, let's make no goals at all, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. no, <laughs> that kind of defeats the purpose. You need to have some orientation and you need to find out what's enough. Because we always have this balance of no discipline whatsoever. Everything goes, utter chaos. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but hey, I'm a youngster. I want to be respected. I want to be regarded as a look at this young leader. They're doing so well, but they know nothing. They don't have much experience. They don't have much insight. They mm -hmm. just want to be awesome, be fantastic with not much experience. And all of us want that because all of us have been that. None of us come into this world ready-made with all of the experience and all of the sort of mana or, or respect due us, if you will. All of us are a bit impatient and that's okay yeah. perfectly perfectly all right <laughs> yeah yeah but you know so, before i met you i felt myself really lonely thinking about all of this so you, it's really glad to have you uh, to, to to be able to talk to you all about this because uh i i was really very criticized about this possibility of changing things to uh, according to the context and always with a critic critical thinking about it not changing everything for everything really this is something that i think not everyone has realized it 
the, 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 the consultants on the market, but I, I really, they are changing their mindset, but we have some, we need some time for them to adjust yet. How do we do that? What do we do to, to enable that, to be better catalysts for that? Only easy questions so on many. the Focus podcast. Yeah, only, <laughs> only easy questions. <laughs> I think we have so many um, examples that the, I always use it, this, this phrase, but I think it's really, it is like it is. I mean, your, your formula of success can always be your formula of, of fade in the long term. Because mm. you do not know what is going to happen, it's the, the it's a success formula for now, but it does not guarantee that it's a success formula for today. Mm. And with COVID, <clears throat> with this example of these great companies that fade away, that just go away, I think you have the the evidences that things must you can know you you have to always be thinking that is everything right? I mean. We have to always think about to have that little voice telling you maybe there's something wrong for, for the future for, 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 about this that I do the work now, but this, this may not work for the future. And I, I think that we have lived for some, some crises right now, and we are going to live for other crises for, for some time, that people are going to, to be more willing to, to listen to this because unless they are totally blind i mean there's no way with all these changes all these crises I, I i do not understand how they can be stricken on this linear view of the world i think i have some thoughts on this one um i'm noticing whenever i i feel this tension and say, I, I get tempted to say to myself, I don't know what this, these people are thinking. I use that as a signal to say, right, cultivate some empathy, put yourself in their shoes. What's their world like from their perspective? So for instance, um, in quite a few organizations, uh, particularly in the social sector, there's a reverence towards empire. What I mean by that is I have my fiefdom. I have my organization. I'm protecting, I'm building, I'm nurturing my organization. They are my people. I control access to my people. People report to me. People work for me. I think of myself as being in charge of these people. Right? And why do I do that? Well, I do that because that's how it's always been done. I, that's how I see all my peers uh, doing. So that's the game we're playing. We're combating fiefdoms, right? I need to look good. I need to make you look bad. Um, I engage in posturing of, of various kinds. It's, it's, it's a wonderful game that we've been playing kind of forever. And there's no, not much external pressure to change the game. Because the game is what the game is. Yeah? And if I happen to be an individual that's actually more interested in genuine service to the people that we provide value for, and I take my eye off of the, this kind of political uh, arena, then I may be taken unawares and my influence may be diminished maybe um, ruined, if you will. I can be sidelined. So therefore, it's natural that I may kind of pay more attention to the politics and posturing and infighting as opposed to the actual service. So that's how we get some difficulties, we get some challenges. Now, this may sound harsh. This may sound like a, like a criticism, but it's not what I'm seeking to achieve. What I'm seeking to achieve is empathy with the people that are struggling to make things better for the people that they serve, while at the same time surviving in the context in which they operate. We're prisoners of our system. 
So if we want to yeah. change the system, we must notice what the system is and what are the habits that can help us to actually make transitions and, and changes in the system. I am still an optimist. I'm still very much hopeful for the future of humanity. And I'm hopeful that our social sector can become much more effective, much more insightful. Definitely. And yes. that requires us to actually pay better attention to oversight and be gentler, kinder, uh, and, and more inquisitive and pay attention more to learning together and sense-making together as opposed to just my empire, my posturing, my um, fighting with my opponents and so on, right? So um, I will ask you, what thoughts do you have in this general area? Well, I have, it's funny that you talked about it because I have some experience on the social sector too. And even in the social sector, I mean, when I came to, came to them, I thought, oh, we are going to find a beautiful world because people care about people if they are social. And I, and I, find, I found some, some people that were so um, egocentric. I mean, the, the organization was built for themselves, not to deliver better for society. And it's a social company. I mean, how is that possible? And I was really shocked at the, the first time. And uh, when I do, when I find this kind of, 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 of company, I try to bring some rationality. I mean, how much do you do for society? How is your indicators that you're building for society, that you're delivering for society? Do you see you're doing this practice because you want that, but this is not good for society because you could do much better with this money that you get. So I always try to, to do that. But there is one thing that I think is, is really important when you talk about change, how we help this to change. I think that when you discuss about it, when you have this kind of, uh, of initiatives that you have, that we talk about it and we talk about it in an accessible way. I mean, it's easy for understand. We are not talking on academics. We are talking about for everyone. If we talk about it, it starts making sense for people and people start to say, no, I do not accept that. This is clear for me. I understand it now. So I think communication is a key issue on, is key on this changing process. And this is why I, I really I was glad when you invited me to have this kind of conversation. Thank you very much, Renata. We're going to start looking at closing this down. And um, I'm going to ask a question Horia always asks uh, at the end of each of these interviews. And that is, what have we not asked you that we should have asked? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> oh, I don't know. If... <laughs> well, I talk about the dexterity. I talk about... I talked about the competence and confidence. I talked about teaming, which is a subject that I really loved. I even talked about family business that I didn't know I, I was supposed to talk. And, and I talked about my doubts. I think that it's, it's an important thing to talk about because you got to show yourself as a uh, vulnerable on, on all the, the issues that may seem very rational and very linear and very dominated. And I'm really, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable talking about my insecurities and my doubts. So, well, I think I have spoken about everything that cares about me I, I well i'm working on culture right now i'm studying culture because i think it's key when you talk about cooperation and especially on traditional corporations and i'm i this is my study right now i may work on a, a product for this and and i have another doubt oh, yeah again the doubts but i want to learn how to how to help my companies, my clients to be better on making and on controlling experiments. I don't have a, a, a methodology yet and I'm really searching for it. How do we experiment better? How do we control our experiments so we can learn faster and better? Mm -hmm. And But I could not 
talk too much about it because I'm still learning. I'm searching for it. So just a hint, if you want to look into that, go have a look at what the Lean uh, Lean Change Management uh, Camp has done, uh, the Jason Little Body of Knowledge. That's a good start. Great. Thank you. I'm going to do that. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, other ideas that come to mind in that space are the improvement kata. Um, oh, yeah, I, I know that. Yeah, ra range of ideas and related to that, then there's the whole A3 thinking um, mm -hmm. process that can flow at different levels of scale as well. So that's also very, very handy. Um, the challenge is yeah. you talked about OKRs as well. And too often, we're so drawn into detail, and we, we forget the big picture, because OKRs are personal, because yeah? I'm articulating my OKRs, and yet, for OKRs to be effective, they can't be my OKRs, they need to be an OKR network, so it has to be yeah. for the whole community, so that, I think, is a, a really great insight, how do we balance the uh, personal to the social to the to the global i think that's fantastic it's a really great idea that um we should explore next time yeah and and i want to explore that with you we have already talked about it we learned, i want to learn that with you i cool. particularly love it and I, I, i'd be glad to talk about it nice all right well thank you so much Renata. i'm horia and i'm thank you so much. Thank you very much, Renata. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye. A very Bye. nice time we had.